and welcome to Eastgate School of Preachers. Now the School of Preachers, the tagline we've kind of gone along with is the idea is that it is to teach men and women to teach the Word of God in their own context. So this is a, a training school and while there will be a fair bit of focus specifically on the ministry of preaching, you'll notice that the things that we're looking at and we're talking about in all contexts uh, will apply very well to someone who is maybe um, leading a Bible study or explaining the Word of God in terms of evangelism. Um, so this hopes to train men and women to handle God's Word in such a way uh, that brings about change in their lives. So I'm excited for the start of this. Uh, I believe very strongly in uh, Ephesians chapter 4 that uh, the church is um, supposed to be equipping the saints for the works of ministry. And so this, we hope to be the first of a number of different training schools that we run as a church. Uh, so this one is the School of Preachers. Uh, it'd be my hope down the line to have a school of discipleship, a school of evangelism, and possibly also a school of leadership. It's going to take a little bit of time to develop each of these programs, but the idea is the first time round we'll run them in-house, um, and the goal would be that further down the track, um, as we refine the material, and that hopefully it would be something that we can use to equip and bless um, other people as well. But there's two main reasons why I'm excited about running the School of Preachers. The first reason is that it is the unquestionable mandate of the church is to preach the Word of God. I mean, if you look there, as Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1-5, to Paul says to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. In particular, notice I've underlined that expression. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. You see, preaching is the unquestionable mandate of the church to preach the word of God. Now, when it says in season, meaning when it's being well received, when people want to hear preaching from the word of God, preach the word. But when it says out of season, even if it's not a time when things are flourishing, where people are flocking to hear the word of God, even during those times we are to preach the word. Because it is God's word. We are not to doubt God's word is any less effective or powerful during times when it does not perceive like it is being well received. So that's the first thing I'm excited about is that this is something, it is one ministry you can guarantee that God is in favor of at all times. And the second thing is, is that I'm excited to see how God's going to use different people in the life of our church and through others who are watching this material online. Now, some of you will be involved in this class and think, I will never preach a sermon in a church in my life. And you might not. But some of you, through this class, because it's not just going to be theory, but for those who are intending in-house here in, in Toowoomba, it's going to be a very practical class. We're going to be engaging with one another in, as we discuss different things, but also everyone in the class who is attending it here we will be given a Bible passage and will be asked to prepare a 10-minute Bible talk uh, to present to the group for everyone uh, to give you some feedback, uh, some constructive feedback and some help and some encouragement and maybe uh, possibly provide for some further uh, growth and development in that area if we believe it's an area that God has gifted you. Now the reason why I say that is because on my own experience, I never thought that I would be preaching. I went to Bible college having worked at a Christian youth camp and I was convinced I'm going to be a youth pastor. It's all just going to be like camp, lots of silly games, a little bit of Bible teaching and all that stuff. 
And it was during my time while I was at Bible college and I was helping out and being involved in a, in a church in the area. And the minister was under a fair bit of pressure over certain things that had happened. And as a result of that, I could see the stress that it was placing on him. And sometimes he asked if I could help and do some things that I didn't think that I was capable of doing and didn't feel entirely comfortable. But because I was concerned about him and the stress that he was under, I said, yep, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a crack. And it was through that experience of trying things that I didn't think that I would ever be used of God in doing that I found that God had actually gifted me in those areas. So I'm excited for um, all of us who are in involved in this training school because you'll be find some people who discover that they have a gift they never knew they had. And as a general principle, I would say that with regards to spiritual gifts. Often you won't know what gifts you have until you try something. You may try something and you may find out and be absolutely certain that you are not gifted in that area. But other times you might be pleasantly surprised and you'll love and see the joy it is to actually use the gift that God has given you because there'll be something that has a fire in you who wants to use the things because that's why God has given them to you. So I'm really looking forward to see um, how that pans out over the, uh, the course uh, of this training school. Now I reckon there's going to be some of you who are really, really nervous. Now, you could be nervous for two reasons. You could be nervous because you just don't like standing out the front of people. A lot of people hate speaking publicly in front of a group of people. Some of you will be nervous in that respect. Some of you might be entirely confident. You speak in front of people all the time in your other work environment, and you think, easy as. But I guarantee you will always be nervous preaching. And I think, when do we naturally get nervous? We naturally get nervous when something is important. So I would hope that we would all feel a sense of nervousness when we engage in something such as preaching because we're acknowledging that handling God's word is a very important matter. We read in Isaiah 66 verses 2, well the second half of verse 2, but this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. So I want to really sort of begin on that foundation that teaching and handling God's word is a weighty matter. It's not something to be approached casually. Now James has some very um, stern words, which I don't believe any pastor has embroidered into their pillow. It's not something that too many people are overly affectionately attached to, but it's an important statement nonetheless. James chapter 3 verse 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with stricter judges, judgment. Nobody wants to be judged. It says, no, if you are going to teach, you're going to be judged with a stricter judgment because handling God's very own word is an important task. And so I want us to begin with that healthy fear and respect for the task that we're undertaking. Not to put you off of it, but also to just honour and respect the nature of what it is that we're going on about. So to give you a bit of an overview, what is this course all about? School of Preachers will be a seven or eight week course. Uh, as we've said from the beginning, the tagline is training men and women to teach the Word of God in their own context. Again, a lot of focus will be on um, church-based preaching ministry, uh, but the mindset and approach will be very similar in terms of how we uh, prepare for such things, and we'll um, talk about that as we get to it. But we'll also look at um, communicating to different types of audiences, different age groups along the way. The classes aren't just going to be theory. It's not going to be just me speaking non-stop. That being said, those watching the videos, that will be the case because I'm not high tech enough to be able to do it and interact with you during the process. But the truth is, we've all been exposed to a lot of preaching. So we've all heard different sermons, we've all heard things that we'd like, we've all seen things we'd like, seen things that we didn't like. So as we uh, talk about and evaluate not only one another's sermons, but some of the Eastgate sermons and some other sermons that we might listen to, we can learn and 
sort of engage with one another as to what um, merits or um, problems that a, a particular sermon may have had. Now the, the teaching material is not just um, the wisdom of Steve. It'll include um, things that I've learnt both through my studies at Bible College but also uh, through the seven years of preaching ministry that I've had. But I realise I am far from being the fount of all wisdom when it comes to preaching. So while we have set uh, one book which is Gospel-Based Preaching or Gospel-Centred Preaching by Tim Chester and Marcus Honeyset, that is our, um, our set textbook that we're working through as a group. Um, I'm also offering another book called uh, Power Through Prayer by Ian e. Bounds, which is uh, just a fantastic book in terms of getting you to think in terms of a pastor's or a preacher's prayer life being the very power and the source of his uh, preaching ministry. But beyond that, what I'm going to do is put up on the screen is a list of other books that I'm interacting with. Now, there has been some fantastic preachers who had a long healthy preaching ministry who have written great books on the topic and if you are particularly interested in uh, one or more of these authors then uh, have a look at this list of uh, books that are available and if you want to read one of those then I can highly commend them to you. Um, you'll notice there there is also a, a series of lectures that Martin Lloyd-Jones has done. There's about I think 18 all up um, and there's one in particular which we have on our School of Preachers site at Eastgate Bible Church uh, if you go there, you'll see the link to the, the School of Preachers uh, that I would say is almost necessary uh, to listen to. But not only will we be teaching and discussing different things, I mentioned earlier that every single person enrolled in the School of Preachers will be given a Bible passage to present to the group a 10-minute Bible talk. Now, I'll say up front that the Bible passages that I choose will be simple, straightforward Bible passages. So they're not going to be Bible passages given to you, for you to figure out how you can handle a really difficult part of the Bible. Uh, we want it to be something that's pretty straightforward as to what it's about so that what we can look at and examine is how you go about communicating and preaching that message uh, to an audience. And in future weeks we'll have a list of Bible passages that you can that you can choose from to work on that. So the structure of the classes that we'll be going through look a little bit like this. Firstly, today's one, we've just had a sort of introduction, but the main topic we're about to look at is what is the goal of preaching? Uh, the next session we're going to look at what is the means of preaching, as in what tools do we have available to us to, uh, to achieve those goals. Thirdly, we're going to look at the content of preaching. In session four, the priorities of preaching. In session five, writing a sermon. Session six, delivering a sermon. And in the final session, evaluating a sermon. Not only evaluating other people's sermons, but how do you have an ongoing process of evaluating your own sermons in a way that's going to help you uh, to grow in using this particular gift. Now we're going to look at our first topic for our first session, which is what is the goal of preaching? Now, why do you think I would start with the question of what is the goal of preaching? Now, the reason why we start here is what you determine to be your goal will affect the way you do everything in terms of your preparation in your actual preaching as well. So it's important that you identify what are you aiming at or what are you establishing as your goals Otherwise, you'll have no sense of direction of what you're doing in any of the steps along the way. Now, I want us to stay open up into God's Word and look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1-6, to 6, a fantastic uh, passage speaking about the nature of all Christian ministry, really. Uh, we're going to apply it here in the, in the preaching context, but I'd say it's a fantastic passage uh, to be applied to evangelism. Uh, and Bible studies and various other things as well. So let us, let's read with me here from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we've renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. 
And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness has shone in your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So in just six verses there, Paul outlines a number of things that we should do, but also a number of things that we should not do if we are to have a solid, faithful ministry. So firstly, looking at those verses, what should a preacher not do? And the first thing you'll see in the very first verse, therefore do not lose heart. Now it's important that we don't lose heart as preachers, A, because we've already seen that it is the mandate of God to preach the word of God in season and out of season, so don't, don't lose heart when things become difficult. But also we need to be reminded not to lose heart because not every person is going to like everything you say. That it, such is the nature of the, the living and active word of God, it convicts and it goes contrary to our human nature. There are things the Bible teaches that our human nature naturally does not like. Now that doesn't mean we ever set out to be offensive, but keep in mind that do not lose heart Sometimes you will be encouraged for your ministry. Sometimes you will find it tough and people will actually be upset with you because of your ministry because you have, or presuming you have faithfully taught the word of God. Secondly, in verse 2, not using underhanded methods. Or in other words, that the way in which you go about your preaching, the methods in which you use should not undermine the message that you present. There should be integrity both in the content of the message but also in the way in which you communicate it. On a slightly similar um, direction in verse 2, we do not practice cunning. That's one phrase in the ESV that I really don't like. Grammatically it doesn't sound right but apparently it is okay to say to not practice cunning. It means that in our preaching ministry we need to not be misleading or deceptive or manipulative in any way at all. Again, verse 2, we are not to tamper with the Word of God. One of the things I really love about biblical preaching is that you don't have to have any original ideas. Everything that we need for life and godliness, all scriptures breathed out by God, that you might be complete and trained for every good work, we don't need to add any original idea. Everything we need, every tool we need for our ministry is the very Word of God. It's not our job to bring in new or original ideas. Our job is to take what God has made known and communicate that clearly um, through our preaching. In fact, I'd say that if you ever feel like you've come across something in this Bible or an approach or an understanding of a particular passage that you don't believe anyone ever has come to before, then I would say tread very, very cautiously because there's probably very good reason why somebody hasn't come to that conclusion beforehand. And the last thing it says here that a preacher should not do is we do not proclaim ourselves. When we are preaching, it is not about us. It's not about us getting attention. It's not about that people might be impressed with us in any sense. We are not proclaiming ourselves. We are proclaiming Christ. We don't want people looking at the messenger. We want people looking at the one to whom the message points. So what is preaching according to these verses? Well, in verse 2 it describes preaching as being the open statement of the truth. We've already said nothing underhanded uh, to clearly proclaim what God has made known because it is God's word, it's all good, it's worth proclaiming. And in verse 5, 
We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, our preaching should always center on the person of Jesus Christ and upon his lordship. So what is the goal of preaching? According to the book in which we're looking at, Tim Chester and Marcus Honeysett's Gospel-Centered Preaching, they've identified three main goals, and I think they're good goals, so they're the ones that we're going to work with as well. And the three goals he set forwards are capturing the affections for Christ so that lives are changed and that God is glorified. And we're going to go through each of those three things and unpack them a little bit, what it looks like to aim for these three things as a goal in our preaching. Firstly, how do we capture affections for Christ? And before we go any further, it's worth saying that affections and emotions are not the same thing. Affections I would speak of as being something uh, far deeper, something we treasure deeply within our heart um, that is probably a bit more long-lasting, like an emotion can come and go. For example, you could watch a movie and you could be even moved to tears by it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has any profound, long-lasting effect upon your life. You might finish the movie, go home, go to bed, and it never moves you in any sense whatsoever again. When we talk about capturing affections, I like the way that both it is taught in Proverbs and also in Jesus' teaching, is that out of the, the depths of our heart, that is where all of our decisions and all of our actions come from. What you really treasure deep inside will affect every single thing that you do. But at the same time, we do need to be careful that we are not trying to manipulate people's emotions, but rather that we might present the gospel and Jesus Christ in such a way that it captures people's affections, that they naturally take a deep-seated uh, root in their hearts. Now, I've been in churches where uh, the atmosphere, the preaching was very emotional. Is that an indication that hearts, affections have been captured for Christ? And the simple answer to that question is, I do not know. The fact that someone responds to something emotionally on a Sunday doesn't necessarily mean that their heart's affections are being captured by Christ. The only way you would be able to measure that is, see, is their life changed beyond that point? Are they changed on Monday as they go back to the regular swing of work or are they back to everything they were beforehand? So how do we capture people's affections for Christ? I think it's explained similar wording in, in Tim Chester's book, but it's also the way that Martin Lloyd-Jones speaks about it. And he says, when preparing to preach on a particular passage, in your preparation, keep dwelling on the Word of God until such point that you have personally had your own heart captured in the affections for Christ through it. That you have been personally moved and changed by the Word of God. Because he says, if you haven't been affected by the word of God, then don't be surprised that the people whom you share the word of God with are not affected by it in any way either. Let me give you an example. Imagine a time you had some really, really exciting news. And because of the, the passion and excitement you have about this news that you're sharing with people, they sort of become partakers. They become and they share in the joy with you. It may be to a lesser extent, but because of the passion, the excitement, and the way in which you share about something so passionately, people get involved, they get captivated, they get brought up into it. And the same should be when we come to preaching the Word of God. It should have captured us into such an extent that when we present our excitement and our enthusiasm towards people, that they enter into that that a passion for what, who God is and what he is doing. The basic premise is that this is good news. Good news needs to be something that is displayed in a way that looks like you actually believe it to be good news. I'll give you an example of the complete opposite to illustrate the point. Uh, when my wife Sarah was pregnant with our second daughter Mackenzie, I wanted to communicate that to the church, but I didn't want it to be in such a way that was making a big issue of it. And what I did, which I now realise was a stupid thing to do, was when I was preaching the sermon that Sunday morning, 
I just made a sort of casual side reference, totally monotone, something about uh, there'll be an extra member in our family in November that year and just kept on going. And after that sermon, I had a lot of people come up to me and said, Steve, did you just say that Sarah's pregnant in your sermon? Because what they understood is that this was exciting news, but it made no sense to them that something that was such exciting news would be referred to as a sort of passing side note that didn't draw any attention whatsoever. I was like, if you are actually going to have a second child, I would expect to see something a bit more by way of passion and excitement in that. So that is the point. With our preaching, we must immerse ourselves in the Word to an extent that um, it captures us, um, it changes us, it stirs up our hearts' affections for Christ so that when we come into the pulpit or when we go into a, to a Bible study we're leading, we have an enthusiasm and a passion that has actually been changed by the Word of God and that we will uh, try and draw people into share of, of what we've experienced of God through that same uh, Bible passage. But let me repeat again. Do not be surprised if the people to whom you present the Word of God to are not in any way captivated by it if you have not been either. So that leads to the second point. We are capturing the affections for Christ in order that lives are changed. Read with me from James chapter 1, in, uh, verses 19 to 27. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not only hearers, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now there can be a tendency, and I've fallen into this same trap, where we think that as long as I have presented factually the contents and the meaning of the Bible passage that I have done my job and people will naturally respond in obedience. But that is not the way in which things happen. Say, so for example, we could see from James chapter 2, and it's, now this is raised in, um, in Tim and, and Marcus's book, see that preaching is not just about whether or not people hear it. Hearing's neither here nor there. Like we're told in James chapter 2, even demons believe and shudder. So it's not about whether or not people hear certain things. It's not about whether or not even people intellectually believe certain things. What matters is what we do with what we hear. So what's the aim of preaching the word of God according to these verses? Well, in verse 21 it says that it is to take root. It's not just supposed to be the, the word of God that is heard, but it is referred to as being the implanted word. Not just something that we've, we've heard, it's gone into our ears, but something that takes root and something new begins to grow and change as a result. In verse 22, it's not just to be learnt or heard, but it is to be practiced. It is to be put into action. Now, I like that example that he uses of being like someone who looks into a mirror and then goes away and forgets what he looks like. Now, I'm a bloke now. Us blokes aren't overly famous for spending a lot of time looking in the mirror. And that's been to my detriment on a number of occasions. I've had plenty of times when I've gone out to the shops and it's not until after I get home uh, that my wife has pointed out that I had something on my face 
uh, whether it be from breakfast or from coffee or something like that. Even though I might have had breakfast or coffee with her, she didn't notice it then. It's not until I've gone out uh, in the public sphere that everyone, I come home and then realise that I had something on my face. Had I looked in the mirror before I went out, I probably would have addressed it. My natural reaction was, I don't want to go out with, with, with coffee on my face, I'll sort that out. And the same is that that's the nature of what the Word of God is supposed to do. It's supposed to show us our true condition. It's supposed to show us what we are like and also what we are to do about it. To use another example, um, the Toowoomba Ministers Association that I've been involved up here since uh, since I've moved up here. Um, one of the meetings that I went to, I had been playing with my, my daughter Miller in the morning and she'd been putting these Miller stickers all over my jumper. Again, I hadn't looked in the mirror. Head on down to the Ministers Association meeting, meeting a lot of the local ministers for the first time I might add. Got these Miller stickers all over me. Not a single person said anything and it wasn't again until I got home, until I realised I was just hanging out with all the ministers with stickers with my daughter's name on them. And none of them said a single thing. Now, true disciples of Jesus Christ are supposed to deny themselves. Now, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. The word of God shows us our true condition. And it shows us what we need to do. But true preaching should not only show us what we need to do, it should not only uh, captivate people's affections and change people's lives, but it should also equip these people to be able to do the same for others, that they might be able to communicate the gospel or communicate the, the word of God in such a way that captures their affection and um, causes others uh, to be changed in the way in which they live. The next thing I want to look at is how do we evaluate good preaching? What is it when someone says, that is good preaching? What types of things do they identify as being what makes preaching good? Now, for some people, it's all about the content. Now, it's all about whether or not what they've said is truthful and in line with the claims of Scripture. And that's fair. That's an important thing. We've already seen it in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that we are to have open statement of the truth, that we are not to mishandle the word of God. But sometimes we can get so wrapped up in explaining something theologically correct, totally accurate and faithful to the scriptures in such a way that doesn't actually captivate anybody in any way whatsoever. It can become merely an intellectual thing. And sometimes we can even go along on that path and not even realize it. We think, here I am faithfully preaching the word of God, wondering why nobody's being changed. And again, we go back to that point. If we haven't been affected by the word, and if we're not making it our goal to have hearts captivated for Jesus Christ, that their lives might be changed, if we're not aiming for these things, um, the most accurate thing is not going to change a single person. Others might say, you know, it's all about whether or not it made me feel something, or that sermon was great, it, you know, it really wound me up. Now, whether or not either of those two are a sign of good preaching is, is very hard to determine. Both of them on their own can be pretty lifeless. Just being theologically accurate, but without an appeal to the heart and seeing the glory of God, can be far from being good preaching. And the same way, just causing someone to feel something without there being a very close connection to what they're feeling is based upon the truth of scripture can indeed be an issue. We need to consider these things, but we need to not waver from our goal that we're proclaiming God's worth faithfully for the goal that hearts' affections are one for Christ so that lives are changed for the glory of God. It can be really easy to, to preach as a life instructor. We think, here I am, I'm teaching the Bible. The Bible tells us how we are to live in this world in relationship with God and with re in relationship with others. And we think, well, if they're Christians, if I tell them how Christians are to live, they're automatically going to do it. 
But the thing is, when we are just week in, week out, commanding people, this is how you live as a Christian, you'll find that often at best, you are likely just to get cold-hearted obedience and possibly even a degree of resentment that they don't want to do these things. It's just like a sense of slavery. They feel like I'm a Christian. It's a burden, but this is what I've got to do, so I've, I've got to do it. That's why we've been talking about all the way from the beginning. Our goal is to, to show God in all of his beauty, in all of his splendor, uh, that he might be forthright and forefront, that people see him and, and it actually becomes the most natural and liberating thing, the actual natural desire of our heart to live and walk in obedience to our God. I like to think of it this way. Say I was to, ex to describe to you a particular a food item or a meal and give it to you by its name or on, on the other hand I could give you the way that that same meal is described either on a, a restaurant menu or on a cooking reality TV show where they talk about the very same meal but do so in such a way that talks about all of its qualities in it in such a way that grabs your attention and creates your desire for that meal. Now that's what I'm talking about as we're handling God's word. We want to present God in all of his glory that they might see his beauty, his splendor, and so that it becomes a natural heartfelt desire to want these things, to desire them and to pursue them both naturally rather than being um, slavish um, obedience. As Marcus Honey said, says in page 16 of the book that we're looking at, if all you have done is to explain the passage, you haven't done your job. We're looking more than just for people to understand what the Bible says, but they be captivated in such a way that they are naturally called and compelled to walk in obedience. The third goal that we're looking at is that so that God is glorified. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through to 17. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things on heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Now as you read through that passage in Ephesians chapter 1, there are two phrases that you keep seeing coming up time and time again. To the praise of his glorious grace or for the praise of his glory. You could be said that every single thing which God does, he does for the goal of his glory. And likewise, we as his people, according to 1 Corinthians 10.31, where it says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. So everything God does is for his glory. Everything we do should be for the glory of God. Now this is where this becomes difficult. We use this term, the glory of God, be God be glorified, over and over again. It's a regular term in Christian circles. But sometimes I wonder, 
how many Christians could give an answer as to what it actually means to give God glory or what does it mean for God to be glorified. Now the word essentially comes back to a, a root word which meant to, to shine brightly. To glorify God means to shine the light on who God is, all of his nature, his attributes, his actions, to put him first and foremost. Now, to magnify the nature and the person and being of our God. So that is what is our goal is when we're talking about preaching so that hearts are captivated, lives are changed for the glory of God, that through our preaching and as lives are changed, that it would show people something of the nature of the splendor and wonder of our God at work in his people through his word. Because we normally think of praise of God, and that's normally part of it. But we need to remember glory as being presenting God in all of his wonder and splendor. And that is, through our preaching as lives are changed, that that be to the glory and shine light on his character as a God who is actively involved in the lives of his people as people hear the gospel, as someone teaches the word of God to them, and they are brought out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved Son, that it might testify to and shine light on the God who is by nature a forgiving and a saving God. God is the one who is changing people. It is never the preacher's job. God alone is to be glorified, not the speaker. Or as our book says on page 29, it says, Our job is to preach the glory of God for the glory of God. That is, our job is to present the beauty, the full spectrum of who our God is, what he has done, what he is doing, so that he might receive the glory from that. Now I want to finish this session by asking the question, which might seem a strange question to ask at the end of the very first session, is what is preaching? Now, if we're talking about the school of preachers, narrowing down what do I mean by preaching is probably a pretty important thing to get out of the way. And in the end, you're probably going to find it's a bit of a blend between what we're looking at today is what is the goals of preaching, but also what we're going to look at next week, which what are the means of preaching? What tools do we have available to us to achieve those goals? So here's the definition that I've come up with. It's the whole counsel of God being declared through the whole personality of the speaker to the whole condition of the hearers by the power of the Spirit to win the heart's affection for God, to bring about Christ-like change for the glory of God. That's quite wordy, but we'll sort of go through that one phrase at a time and explain what I mean by that. Firstly, it is the whole counsel of God. As Paul is uh, speaking to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, he says, I did not, uh, I declared to you the whole counsel of God. And as we see in 2 Timothy 3.16, that, that all of God's word is breathed out by God, is useful for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So all of God's word is good and all of it should be, should be presented. We should never just pick out our favorite bits. All of it is the display of God and his work in the world. It's the whole counsel of God through the whole personality of the speaker. You know, every preacher is going to be different in the way in which they present. And it should reflect something of their own personality. So if you're naturally a, a particularly flamboyant person and you've got a face that's got far more expression than this one, which hopefully you do, then it's expected that your, your preaching is going to come across the same way. It's going to be flavoured very much by the, the personality of the person delivering the message. Just like even in the, in the books that we have in the Bible, um, even though they are very much the word of God, we still see the, the personality and the flavour of the, the human author whom God is, is working through by the Holy Spirit. So it's, there's, there's a very real danger in thinking that there's only one way to be a good preacher. You know, we all have preachers that we really enjoy listening to. And while it's good to learn from them, it will look very unnatural and fake and possibly even um, discredit your message if you just try and become exactly like them. 
Like I've come across people who are so keen to preach in a way like a particular preacher they look up to that they change their voice completely, they change their personality, they do things that on any other day of the week they would never do. And it just looks fake and it distracts from the message they're trying to teach. Be, be yourself. Yes, be passionate because this is, this is something that, this is the very word of God and it should have taken hold of you and you're, you're calling others that they would be captured by it to bring about um, Christ-like change. But be yourself. You don't have to be John Piper or some other preacher that you particularly like. Present the thing according to your own personality. So it's the whole counsel of God through the whole personality of the speaker to the whole condition of the hearers. Whatever setting you're in, you need to be aware that nobody, that the whole group are not going to be on exactly the same page. You're going to have Christians, you're going to have new Christians, you're going to have mature Christians, you're going to have some who are struggling, you're going to have some that everything's going well, you're going to have people who aren't even Christians at all, you're going to have people who are hostile to God. You want to present to the whole personality. You do not want to target a message that is specifically targeted at Christians at a particular level in their spiritual walk. You want to think about there's going to be an entire range of people in the room in which you are preaching to or leading a Bible study with or sharing the gospel with and to do it in such a way that you reach a broad range of people and call them all uh, to be um, respond to Jesus Christ. So through the whole counsel, whole condition to the hearer, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to look at the means of preaching next week, but even when we look at some of those things that we've established as our goals to um, win about heart's affections for Christ, our natural response is, I can't change someone's heart, I can't stir up someone's heart. And you're right, we need to start there. Every single one of the means that we have to achieve these goals are God resources, they're not human resources, particularly as such. So it's, this is happening by the power of the Spirit. Is God's Word is Spirit-breathed. It is breathed out by and, and inspired by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we need to be praying that the Spirit be working in the, the lives of those who would hear it. To win about the heart's affections for God, we've already uh, talked about that and referred about the way that um, Jesus spoke about it in uh, Luke 6.45, the good person out of good treasure of his heart produces good, and out, the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil, because out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. In other words, the issue is our heart. We need to address the heart, because what happens in the heart in the very deep recesses of our affections, that will, will be um, where everything that we think and do will come from. To bring about Christ's life change, whether we're talking about an unbeliever coming to know Jesus for the first time to going from uh, the domain of death into life, from, from darkness into light, we want to see as a goal of our preaching to see people change to become more like Christ. I mean, after all, that's what we're told in, in Romans 8, 29. This is one of the reasons why God predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son. So if that's one of God's goals in choosing us, that should be one of our goals as we uh, present and preach the word of God to people. And lastly, for the glory of God that we have just spoken about. So that's the end of, of our session one. Our goals in preaching are to um, win the heart's affections for Christ, to bring about change lives for the glory of God. Next week we're going to look at what is the means of preaching, what, as in what tools and resources do we have available to us to achieve those goals. Um, I would ask you to read before we looking at that session or coming to that session, is that you read chapter 2, the section in uh, Gospel-Centered Preaching, the, the textbook that we're working through. Read through the section on the means of preaching so that you're already in the mindset and you're ready to engage in discussion next week. Thank you.